Hi, I'm Steve. I'm Carla. <laughs> We're geniuses. <laughs> we know how to work computers. Um, we also made a video game called Gone Home. Uh, and yeah, we're going to talk about a couple of specific uh, non-game media influences on our creative process uh, making the game. Because Gone Home is a hodgepodge of different influences from uh, film, literature, television, music, publishing, because Carla and I are much better at synthesizing things than actually being creative. Uh, whoops. Um, <laughs> so just uh, for some context, what is Gone Home if you haven't played it? Um, it is a story exploration video game. Um, specifically, you walk around a house and explore it to find notes and artifacts and uh, things that tell you about the, what? The, the story um, that, that happened to the family that lives there. Um, it's also partially about going through people's uh, bedroom drawers and finding things they don't want you to find. Um, it's a teen drama that centers around a teenage girl named Sam in the mid-90s, um, falling in love for the first time uh, with another girl. So it's a, it's a game that has a lot of stuff going on um, in it. Uh, but specifically, we're going to talk about two very disparate influences on us, Sassy Magazine uh, from the early 90s and The Apartment, which is a film by Billy Wilder. Um, so the setting of Gone Home is, as noted, the 90s. Uh, and it has, you know, um, a number of, I think, fairly earned uh, nostalgic touches in the, in the game, but specifically, it's about the experience of a teenage girl in the Pacific Northwest in the mid-90s, which to us says... Uh, so, yeah, Sassy Magazine. Um, we, uh, Sam totally would have been into it and read Sassy, uh, if only after Lonnie introduced her to it, um, because it was really the only uh, magazine for young women that was worth a damn in the 90s. There was a, really nothing else that was at all comparable. Um, other things were like, you know, teen, and it's just like, you know, come on. Uh, and uh, so, you know, Sassy was a role model to us in a lot of ways. Um, wow, I would really love it if this was uh, one of which uh, was that they were actually committed to being super feminist, um, which is unusual. Uh, they were um, upfront about focusing more on reality and people's actual experiences than, um, you know, the idealized fake version that you uh, see in a lot of other magazines or saw then. Still do now, I'm sure. Uh, this was also the beginning, uh, the early 90s was the beginning of third wave, third wave feminism. So that is sort of the backdrop um, of, our, of Sam's... Uh, zine seen here uh, and so that obviously you know would have shit would have been in the air and she would have been thinking about it um, let's see this is not working uh, down uh, okay so another thing that um, Sassy Magazine did is uh, they didn't talk down to the readers um, they were upfront about how complicated and strange things could be uh, and I mean you know it's a two page spread about the intricacies of picking a college and having to deal with it, because that's a lot to deal with when you're a teenager. Um, it's, it's a lot to do, and it's not downplayed. The difficulty is not glossed over or you know, made to seem uh, improper to think about. Um, unlike, for example, Seventeen, who did this. Uh, I <laughs> Which is maybe a little bit less nuanced about. You, you might have noticed. If you want to study, you may be a nerd, <laughs> according to some people. Yeah. This guy, boy, he thinks she's such a nerd. Um, but uh, yeah, so, okay. Another thing they did, um, which is down, uh, yeah. Another thing they did is, and this is sort of interesting, is all of the writers um, for the magazine, uh, they did a lot of things, they did a lot of individual pieces and they were always credited specifically on their articles. So because they would end up writing a lot of personal material, uh, you actually got to learn about their lives slowly. You got the narrative th of their lives, you know, over the time that you read the magazine, which was a significant amount of time. Uh, and it started being crappy in like 1996, so not past that. But, um, <laughs> but before that, um, you got to, uh, you know, read about uh, all the stuff that uh, they went through in their lives and how they were relating it to the things in the magazine. And so you actually learned about these people as characters in a way uh, from their own writing, which may sound familiar to you if you have played our video game. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we did that. Um, let's see. And then, uh, yeah, so we, because it's such a good uh, role model and influence, we decided that we would, um, uh, we decided we would do a little homage. 
and put a direct uh, reference to it in the game, which is this, and that's our, this is our fake sassy that Sam actually read. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna point out Rachel, <laughs> even though she's totally there in the audience. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, your turn. Yeah. Over to you, Steve. Okay. Um, yeah, so obviously, you know, there was some very contemporary 90s media that was a big influence on us to the point that we put our version directly into uh, Gone Home. Um, but the other side of, of the, the game, aside from you know, the, the setting and the, the characters and when it took place and where it took place, was the methods that we used for storytelling um, in the game. And Gone Home is very much about finding mundane artifacts of these people's lives and focusing on everyday things while giving them significance through context. Um, and one really great example of that for me um, is a film starring uh, Jack Lemmon and Shirley MacLaine uh, from 1960, directed by Billy Wilder, which is called The Apartment. Um, Billy Wilder, is, at this point, is probably better known for stuff like Some Like It Hot and uh, Sunset Boulevard, um, but this was a movie that came later in his career and I felt like was a culmination of a lot of the work that he had done by being smaller and more human, which obviously is something that is interesting to us. Um, the Apartment is about C.C. Baxter, who's a guy that works in an insurance agency in New York. Um, and it has like a classic screwball premise of he's low on the totem pole and so he lends out his apartment to the executives above him so they can have affairs without their wives finding out and a bunch of wacky complications and whatnot. But the thing that, that is inspiring to me about it is that instead of making it a screwball comedy, it very much, while being funny and clever, um, also is about the real repercussions on actual humans' lives that there would be in this situation. You know, it talks about um, the impact that, that all this stuff has on the individuals, and it talks about Fran Kublik's uh, role as a woman in the uh, corporate um, environment of 1960, and it goes on to, to acknowledge depression and suicide and actually look at those in an unflinching way. Um, and one of the ways that it did this that really stood out to me is there are some key scenes throughout the movie where it focuses on the business of what the characters do, the very small quotidian details of um, the character's routine. Um, in one case early on, they're establishing Baxter's, uh, oh, sorry, uh, these are some of Wilder's other movies um, that he's better known for, but early on in the, the film, oh, did it start playing it? Okay, sorry about that. I don't know how these things work. I told you there weren't going to be any more technical difficulties. I was wrong. Um, but uh, there, there's a scene early on in the movie where they establish part of Baxter's character through um, these, these very small details that would not be focused on in other works. So my apologies to the late, great Billy Wilder for hacking the middle out of that clip for time. Um, but the, the thing that I think is really meaningful is that you know there are multiple minutes in the middle of this big Hollywood film that I ended up winning a bunch of Oscars and stuff by a very established director um, that, that did not cut away from any of the, the tiny moments of this character's life. And 
it trusts the audience to be compelled by watching this guy in his routine and learning more about him that way. Um, and Gone Home is so much about finding these tiny pieces of ephemera that on their own have such little meaning, a movie ticket or um, you know, a, a TV guide clipping or a, a logo on a mug, on its own is not something that is like sexy and dramatic, right? That you're saying, this is what we're gonna um, spend a, a, a lot of screen time on. But we knew that the context of who the characters were made these things have meaning um, in Gone Home. The other side of, uh, of using the, the mundane in the apartment was it's used for pacing and tension. Um, there's a scene later where the, the more events have unfolded and Fran Kublik, uh, who was having an affair with this executive, he is like very cruel to her at, at a key moment in the, in the script and she attempts suicide um, in Baxter's apartment. And he gets the, the doctor from down the hall um, to, to come help and the doctor gives him a very simple quotidian job in the middle of the drama. Are you all right, Doc? How many pills are in that bottle? Well, it's half full, about a dozen or so. Do we have to take you to the hospital? Help me, will you? Into the bathroom. Good too. Get that stuff out of her stomach if it isn't too late. You better put some coffee on and pray. So in that scene, um, the mundane is not about characterization. Um, it's very much about the, the feeling of helpness, helplessness that he has and the, um, the fact that doing this very straightforward task, he probably makes himself coffee every morning in the middle of the context of this very dramatic scene where you don't know if this character that's off screen is going to survive, becomes something that builds tension and is um, excruciating to have to sit through. And again, the, the filmmakers do not cut away and let you just assume that's happening. You have to watch all the way through it. Um, as an aside, uh, as sort of like the uh, sassy Ask magazine, as a wink and nod to the apartment, um, we made the law firm here, uh, the offices of Kubelik and Wise, uh, which is, Frank Kublik's last name in the, in the film, so hat tip. Um, but for us, the, 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 the way that this plays out in Gone Home is you know, there were moments, especially near the end of the game, uh, the, the sequence where the player has gotten the attic key and is going to the attic and they don't know what they're going to find, that a lot of players reported to us feeling incredibly tense and describing going to that spot as a heart-pounding experience and they had so much dread and on screen, all you're seeing is somebody walk down a hallway of a normal house. You know, there's not dramatic music or anything. And in fact, in the game, you've walked down that hallway two or three times already. And it's just the same as it was before, except knowing what it means to be doing that walk through this totally normal space in that situation is what gives the moment drama and tension um, and not anything where we were kind of, you know, twisting the the thumb screws on the, on the player in, in a very overt way. You're just relying on the context to provide that meaning. Um, so, you know, between uh, two very disparate uh, influences, two different poles on, uh, on the influences spectrum from something that was from the 90s and about teens to something that was uh, a very, you know, classic film, um, we, we arrived at something that uh, I hope is, wouldn't have been possible without those those two poles on the spectrum. So thanks for letting us talk about our influences. Uh, we appreciate you having us here today.